When the light goes dim. 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 go down. We're live in Columbia, South Carolina at the Red Rooster 7500 Wilson Boulevard in Columbia, South Carolina. Today I have a special guest from Clemson University and Stone Mountain, Georgia and Mr. Carswell. He played at Stone Mountain, Georgia and he also played at Clemson. He had a stint with the San Diego Chargers. Welcome to our show, Mr. Carwell. Man, glad to be here. I appreciate you having me uh, in this beautiful establishment, the Red Rooster. I'm looking forward, you know, I'm a wing connoisseur. So I'm looking forward to diving into some of these wings, but really looking forward to being on the show. And I really appreciate what you got going on. Fantastic, Robert. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask you is what was it that pushed you and drove you to be the player that you were? to gain all of your successes in this game that we love we call football. Mm -hmm. What was it? It's funny you asked that. Really, it didn't have anything to do with football. Uh, it had something to do with my mom and dad. And, uh, you know, my dad, Blue College, worked at U.S. Steel, he drove trucks. My mom, she was a stay-at-home mom initially, and she, you know, taught us how to read and write before going to school, but they instilled in us about being your best in everything that you did. And uh, my mom and dad got a big competitive edge, and so they, they kind of poured that into us. And so I competed with my brother and everything, competed with my sister, not only in things that we did off the field, but academically as well. And so that's what really kind of drove, you know, me to try to be the best that I could be in football. And so coming in high school, you know, I looked around the country, but I didn't want to just be the best player on my team or in my county. I wanted to look wide and say, you know, eventually I'm going to see these guys when it counts, when, when we go to college or when we go to the NFL. So I looked in Texas and found a guy, Jerry Cooper. I looked down in Miami and found a guy, Derek uh, Gibson, he ended up going to Florida State. Um, you know, and I looked at these guys, Deion Grant down in Augusta, and, uh, and I, I compared myself to them. And I had an honest feedback to myself and say, okay, you know, Derek Gibson is better than me in this area. This is the area I have to improve in. You know, Deion Grant is better than me in this area. This is the area I have to improve in. You know, uh, there is, you know, these guys are better than me in this area. Let me improve on that so when I see them at that crossroad, I'm going to be prepared to battle, whether it's for a position on the team or these All-American teams, I'm going to be ready for that. And so, you know, going in, trying to be the best that I can be, not only on my team, but nationwide. Fantastic. That's ironic because uh, when I played linebacker in high school, uh, I mimicked Mike Singletary. Yeah. And uh, I can relate to you if you given that analogy that, that you uh, wanted to see what was around the country, not just in your hometown and not just locally, but you look national uh, to see how you compared against the best of the best. And that, that's fantastic. And when we return to when the lights go down, we'll tell you a little more about Robert as we get into his successes in football. When the lights go down, here live at the Red Rooster in Columbia, South Carolina, 7500 Wilson Boulevard. Doye Universal Studios. We love our country. We love our troops. Your sacrifice does not go unrecognized. Doye Universal Studios. We support you. This episode of When the Lights Go Dim is brought to you by The Red Rooster Sports Bar and Grill in Columbia, South Carolina. And we're back at The Red Rooster here live in Columbia, South Carolina at 7500 
Wilson Boulevard, and I do have my distinguished guest here, Robert Carswell. I'm going to ask Robert this question. What was it that made you so successful? What drove you to be successful on the football field? What did you think about before you made all those accolades in football? You know, just again, trying to be the best that I can be and competing. And so when, when things really started to take off for me, you know, I got my first college uh, college scholarship offer um, as a junior. I got it from NC State. And that really shed some light. And I said, okay, now I see the fruits of my labor starting to pay off. And uh, as I continue to go on, I, you know, I was a parade All-American as a senior in high school, uh, uh, super prep All-American. You know, back then they, they didn't have all these recruiting shows and all that stuff. We had the Lindsay's magazine. And so I remember going to the to the grocery store and getting the Lindsay's magazine and saw those same players that I compared myself up against, seeing my name. They had the top five wow. safeties in the country and seeing my name in that top five. So beginning to see that fruits of my labor and see it paying off and getting a scholarship to Clemson. You know, and I remember um, having these coaches coming in and that was a huge deal, you know, to have Bobby Bowden come to your school and eat lunch. And, wow. I mean, you shut the whole cafeteria down, and we had our own special table eating lunch there, right. having, uh, you know, Tom Osborne come to your house, wow. and Philip Farmer, and that was a big deal. And it was, it was, it was humble because to see that, you know, I had a, a cousin that played for the Redskins that kind of guided me through that. And he said, you, you remain humble. Although you're getting all of these people in this attention, you remain humble and you just be thankful for the opportunity because there are some people that would love to have the same opportunity as you. And so I remain humble and, you know, again, having that blue collar dad, if I did, he was there to bop me on top of that head, you know, even at 18 years old. But just, I just remember hitting the Clemson and, you know, the first game, you hear about the most 25, most uh, uh, memorable seconds in college football and just getting on that bus and riding around. And we were playing Appalachian State my first game. And I'm sitting on that first bus. And it's one thing to watch it on TV. I watched the game and they did the expose and had the camera on the bus. But to be sitting on that bus, when you ride around that stadium and you look in that bowl and it's pulled to the rim, and you got fans beating on the side of that bus. I mean, if they're just sitting here talking about, I'm ready to run through a brick wall. But we get to the top of that hill and they shoot that cannon. Man, I sprinted down the hill, and people don't realize when you get to the bottom, you still got 50 yards to go to get to the center of the park to break it down. And then after we broke it down, they said, you know, as a freshman, kickoff team, get ready. I'm like, man, I just ran all the way down. <laughs> so, but uh, again, that was a phenomenal time in my life. I still got the letters in multiple boxes. Uh, I got a 10-year-old daughter now, and she often wants to go back and read the letters. Yeah. The different things, and I got nephews that play high school football, and I show them that stuff, you know, and, and, and kind of guide them. You know, at first it was me going through, and I followed my brother, and now I'm guiding my nephews and talking to different youth about that process as well. Great. Well, I, I can relate to you again, Robert, because uh, I can remember Joe Paterno, Galen Hall, Danny Ford, and many others coming through at. at at uh, Lower Richmond, uh, where I played at, and uh, that is, uh, it is a special time that we can never get back as, as when we start off and try to mold our football careers. Uh, but Robert, we all know that that day comes when uh, there's dark temptations with all of our successes that we had. You went on and, and signed a contract with the San Diego Chargers. Uh, what are the dark temptations, the side of the game that we sometimes try to keep in, but it overwhelms us? What are some of those dark times that you went through at your demise of your skill of football? I'm going to tell you what's funny is the same thing that keeps you going is the same thing that you miss when it's gone. You know, when I committed to Clemson, I, I really loved the fans. You know, I remember showing up uh, for a recruiting visit and they were playing South Carolina with Duke Staley and all those guys. And, and I remember uh, the fans, it was cold. And I 
And all the bands, you know, a couple of them in the front row had their shirt off and had clips and spells on it. And how crazy they were going and how loud it was. And I said, this is for me. And so, you know, getting drafted by the Chargers and showing up. And now you're looking at out there on the field with Hall of Famers, Junior Seau. You know, I got drafted by Damian Thomas and Drew Brees. And you're going up against Emmitt Smith at the end of his career and, and Jerry Rice and Terrell Owen. These are guys you grew up playing with on the Tecmo Bowl and, and Madden. And now you in this stadium uh, playing alongside these guys and competing with them. And, of course, you know, going to the different stadiums you see, you know, that you grew up watching. I wanted, When we went to Cleveland, I wanted to see the guy with the dog pound mask on. I'm looking for him. <laughs> You know, we went to the Raiders. I'm looking for the guys with the spiked shoulder pads. Yeah. All of the stuff that you grew up watching. But when that day came, you know, I chipped a ball to my knee. And they went back in and they repaired it. And they put me back out there a little bit too early. And, of course, I was a little naive trying to get back into the game. Uh, but I went back out and tore it up again. And uh, they went in to do my surgery. You know, Dr. Andrews down in Birmingham. And he said, I'm going to tell you what. If you go in... And play again. You're probably going to, we can fix it. You can go back out there and you can probably scratch out another year or two, but you're probably going to be walking on the cane by the time you're 30. And hearing that as a 25 year old, my initial response was, patch it up, let's go. You know, because this is, this, I'm at the show. I'm finally here. This is what I've been waiting on. The game is slowing down to me. I'm ready to make plays. And there was a time when I'm in the game and the coach, you know, you watch him film, and he called me Rodney Harrison. My mistake. I said, wow. oh, it's over. It's over now. They, wow. you know, they making that type of mistake where they saying, good play, Rodney. And I'm like, that's me. And so I said, <laughs> I said, it's time. And you know, shortly after that, when I chipped my knee, but uh, to get that call, I'm in the training room. I'm getting training. I got my cell phone. You don't get service now in the training room. But I walk out to my car um, and I, I get a voicemail. And it's Marty Schottenheimer, the secretary. She was like, you know, Coach Schottenheimer wants to see you in the office. I'm like, oh man, you know, what, what's going on? Now, it didn't even click at that point. Mm. So I get up on the elevator, I go to the top, and I'm sitting. Uh, when I get in there, Coach Schottenheimer's signing something on his desk. He never looked up at it. And so he's just signing and, you know, signing and turning around, doing his stuff. And so he said, have a seat. I sit down. I say, hey, what's up, Coach? And he said, well, I'm going to just let you know, you know, we, uh, we're going to go ahead and release you. And uh, I didn't get this still didn't register what was going on. He said, we're going to go ahead and release you. You can go downstairs and sign uh, the release forms in the training room. Good luck to you. And, and I, I'm still sitting down. And I'm like, man, where the cameras at? I know y'all in that place. And so uh, everything, I, I think I asked him a couple questions after that. But everything he said, it sounded like the Charlie Brown teacher. You know, that womp, 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 but I couldn't hear. I mean, I, here I am, 25, uh, everything is going really well. And so I went downstairs. They didn't even know I had gotten released downstairs. In the and so I signed the waiver. The first call I made was to my mom. I told her, hey, before you see it on TV, I just want to let you know. My mom, ever since we began playing Little League, she said, football is not who you are. It's something you do. And she stayed on us about preparing for that plan B. And I'm not going to lie to you. My, my plan B was about this big in the back of my head. But it was always there because of my mom and dad chirping about that. And then we had, uh, you know, Miss Ann Whitley, my faculty advisor at Clemson. And there was a lot of people along the way that dropped that plan B in the back of my head. And you think the youth that aren't listening. They're listening, but that plan B is about that big in the back of their head. But the moment, uh, you know, and I knew it as an athlete, something was different about this knee injury. And then taking into account what Coach Andrews said, I had other teams that called and had interest, but I, I didn't go, you know, I went to the Eagles for, to, for and I couldn't pass the physical. And from there I said it's over. And so I went back on my plan B. But that dark side was, you know, not having that crowd there, not, you know, not being able to make that play, having that camaraderie that, for so long, that brother not having that there, having that taken away. Robert, <clears throat> that that drove me when I when that moment came for me. Mm -hmm. uh, that drove me into a little depression. It did. Uh, yeah. It actually uh, took me because I wasn't one of the ones that had Plan B. 
you, you, you did great to, to have that support cast there for you with that, but I didn't, I didn't have that. I had a, a, a strong, supportive mother and brothers there for support, but no one had experienced being at that highest of the high. And then when you finally hit back mm -hmm. at the bottom, where do you go from here? And that, I just didn't know what to do after that. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, it was tough. I remember going home, um, and after they did, I had to do my six months of rehab, and I stayed in my house for six months. I think back then the PS2 came out, I went and bought a PS2 and the Xbox, and I played games the whole day. And I think I went out to go eat pizza or this and that, but there was a, a level of depression because it was so long. Um, I think I heard Cora Miller on the other show say, you're so regimented. You know, springtime, this is what you're doing. Even to this day, I'm 41. I can go outside, you smell fresh cut grass. There, there's a small thing still in me that says it's time. But when I start doing those high knees and these knees get to clicking and clacking, I realize I'm 41. But you're so regimented. And there's nothing like a lot the camaraderie and the things that go on in the locker room. You know, some of the stuff that happened in the locker room, there is no HR department right. that will come in and shut that down. But, you know, those are the things that you remember when we get together and you get together with your former teammates. You say, hey, you remember when such and such is this, you, you don't have that nowhere else. There's nothing like it in the workplace. There's nothing like it. And, I, you know, I like what helped me out is when Coach Sweeney reached out to the former players and have you come up to coach in the camps and you get around that environment. Or, you know, we get a chance to uh, fellowship to here. Wisdom. Right. And we get a chance to fellowship here. Because I know when we look in our eyes, I know you've been through the same thing I'm doing. And I know you know you, you, you've been there. And, and, and I don't have to explain that. We can come in and dap it up like that. We know what it's about. And we know what it's about. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's day by day. And I miss the game so much. You know, I miss, you know, imposing your will and breaking an opponent down. And now you're looking in their eyes in the fourth quarter, and they don't want them. They turn them away. And there's no other profession where I'm going to teach them now. I can't go in the classroom and impose my will on the second grader. <laughs> but you know, but you just miss those elements of the game. But the biggest thing was the crowd and the, the, the camaraderie, the, the stories that you got. And I'm so good. And, they, they got Facebook now where you can reach out to your teammates and they got these platforms where you can still keep in touch. Fantastic, Robert. Uh, we'll be back to tell you what Robert is up to when we return to When the Lights Go Dim. Here live at the Red Rooster in Columbia, South Carolina, 7500 Wilson Boulevard. We appreciate you for liking our page on Facebook. Georgia TV Network is on YouTube. Just hit the subscribe button and you can watch your favorite shows anytime, any place on YouTube channel, Georgia TV Network. And we're back here at the Red Rooster in Columbia, South Carolina, 7500 Wilson Boulevard in Columbia, South Carolina. And again, we have our guest here, Robert Carswell. Um, my last question in this segment is, Robert, through all of your successes and your failures, uh, from the beginning of your football career to the ending of it, what was it in those things that helped you do what you're doing now? And we'd just love to know, what are you doing now, Robert? You know, it's funny you say that. Um, the things that really helped us be successful in the athletic arena, you know, I had a coach that challenged me back in the day, Coach Fleeg. And he said, I challenge you, when you take your shoulder pads off, your helmet off, your cleats, you're not taking your heart out. Mm. That's what you take onto the field. You take that same heart and that passion into whatever you're going to be, uh, whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to be. Take it in the classroom, take it into your career afterwards. He said, you don't take that off. So that same heart that was on the field, you take that and, and have that same passion and drive into your next career. And so I thought about that. Wow, you know, that same dedication. And if you think about it, you know, I heard a, a, a motivational speaker say this. 
Uh, he said in football, 90% of the game is failed. Hmm. I said, oh, what are you talking about? 90% is failure. When the, when the offensive lines up and they're doing a drive, the first play is not a touchdown. The whole focus is to get a touchdown. So the first play happens, and, and that's a failure because they didn't score. The second play happens, that's a failure because they didn't score. It's not until they get into the end zone. So there might be one play on a 15 play drive that's a success, but you keep calling the play. You keep calling the play. And so I wanted to use that in my life afterwards keep calling the play. So I went back to Clemson. So when I went back, I should have graduated in 2000, but I left about prior to my last semester. And I went back, graduated with a degree in elementary education. Um, I didn't go into education at that time. Um, I went into sales for a while. And now I'm teaching. You know, I'm a second grade teacher. Um, I just finished getting my master's from Wingate University to be an uh, administrator. Um, two years ago, I was named Teacher of the Year. Um, so those same things in that drive, I'm gonna tell you, I know in the world of education, competitive is a bad word. And I'm one of the most competitive people you will ever meet. But in the classroom, you can't do that. But what I do is I tell my students, competitive is not bad as long as you're competing under control. It's the same as fire. You know, they're using fire in this kitchen right now and it's under control and they're cooking the food. You heat your house with fire and you drive your cars with fire, you know, up under the hood. But that same fire, if it's out of control, it can burn your house down. Same thing with being competitive. I think competitive gives me an edge in what I do now because I want to be the best at everything. So I want to be the best teacher. I want to be the best husband. I want to be the best father. Uh, I want to be the best role model for my students. And again, I want to be the best teacher. Awesome. And moving forward, I want to be the best administrator. And so I'm preparing myself the same way we prepare, watching tape and, and getting ready for games. That's how I get ready for my students now and, and, and want to have that impact. And also, uh, I was able with my daughter, we teamed up and we wrote our first children. It's called uh, Robert Uses His Imagination. And it's Can you show that to the public? I can, yeah. Oh, we'll get we'll get to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but it's out there on Amazon right now, and uh, you know, again, that's something I want to model for my students. We were talking about writing, and I got a lot of my boys in there that don't like to write, and so I said, well, how about if I model this writing process for you? And so I ended up modeling the writing process, and I took it to the next step and just published it, you know, right in front of my students' face. But I, I would urge any football player. Again, taking that model, it's always going, things ain't going to always be perfect for you. You got to have that uh, perseverance, the same things that you use in football to be successful. Take that heart and apply it to after the game. But you have to remember, football is not who you are, it's what you do. And, so, and then while you have that platform as a football player, I don't care if it's in high school, college, or the pros, use that platform to do good. because. Even in high school, people look up to you walking down the hallways, and you can use that time maybe to sit down and eat lunch with somebody who's maybe not as popular. Um, you can use that time to give back to the community, and people will follow your lead as a leader of the school. Same thing in college. Use that time to give back, and then, of course, in the pros, use that time to give back. Fantastic, Robert. Uh, you just heard it from a man that's been to the highest of the highs and had the lowest of the lows. And if you could just take a little of what he's just gave, given to us today here live on, on the show, uh, I think you could be pretty successful with it. But we're going to talk about something else right now. It's right at the end of the show. And our college, we played at the same college, Clemson University, is right back in the college football playoff in the final game that will uh, launch out on January 13th on Monday night. Uh, against the LSU Tigers. Robert, who do you think's gonna take this game come Monday? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna be honest, it's gonna be a great, fantastic game, and I think it's gonna mirror the Clemson LSU, uh, the Clemson Ohio State game, and actually mirror the game that uh, Clemson and LSU played back in 2012, where it came down to a last second kick. It's gonna be a slug them out fence, but I think Clemson's gonna pull it out. I know everybody's making a big deal about what LSU did to Oklahoma, but in my mind, there were only three teams deserving to be 
and the elite status in the college football playoff. And really, anybody that played Oklahoma, that's a, a virtual bye week, so to speak. And so people are making a big deal of what these receivers did against uh, Oklahoma's depleted secondary. Think about it. Oklahoma had a lot of guys out, a lot oh, of wow. injuries, suspended guys, and they're not a good defensive team coming out of the Big 12. Think about how Clemson played Alabama last year with Ruggs, uh, Jerry Judy, um, and those uh, those receiving the elite core, elite receiving core, um, and how Coach Venables was able to cook up a scheme to 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 actually go to a to confuse to a, for the first time all season they were able to confuse. Him. But I think coming in, I think the fans have to look at Clemson does not have to shut down this LSU offense. They just have to maintain it. If you look back at the LSU defense, even against Oklahoma, they gave up 28 points. I think if Clemson defensively can hold LSU to under 28 points, they'll win this game 35-28, but it, it could come down to a last second field goal. But I'm picking my Clemson Tigers to pull it out late um, and field goals, a late touchdown to, to put them over the top. I, I, I'm going to mirror that. I, I think... Uh, if you watch the Florida game, mm -hmm. uh, when they played LSU this year, Florida held them, kind of stymied them until the fourth quarter. I think Clemson will continue their success in the fourth quarter, same as what uh, Florida did to them. I, I do think Clemson has the edge over Florida a little bit, so I'm going to two pick my Tigers. I think we'll win by 10. Okay. Okay. And we were at the Red Rooster. Live in Columbia, South Carolina, 7500 Wilson Boulevard. We'll see you when we get back. And we're back at the Red Rooster in Columbia, South Carolina, 7500 Wilson Boulevard. And we're at the end of our show. And we're going to allow Robert to show you something that he worked on with his daughter. Um, it's a book, and uh, we'll let him tell you more about it. Yeah, this is a uh, first children's book that I published. Um, like I said earlier, I'm a second grade teacher, and so we do a lot of, you know, sit down at the carpet and read. And this is something I got a lot of guys in my class that really don't like writing books or writing at all. And, we started the writing process in class, and I kind of, I told them that I would model it for them. And so I modeled this for them, and uh, I got with my daughter. You can see our picture on the back, but uh, this is something that I modeled uh, for my class and decided to take it to the next step and publish it. So it's out on Amazon right now. Um, you can buy the hardback copy or you can get the digital copy. But again, as Robert uses his imagination, and I took it to the next level. I, I used to think I was a rapper. <laughs> back in high school, so I made the book rhyme. And so, um, you know, the kids really like it, and it kind of helps them with uh, rhyming schemes and different things like that. It talks about the importance of imagination. Uh, when I was in school, oftentimes I would draw and get in trouble. Some of these same pictures that I got in trouble for, you can see I did the illustration, but some of the same pictures that I got in trouble for in school, I used that to write this book. And so I want to thank those teachers that you know, got on me for drawing and play. <laughs> give homage to our producers at Doye Sports Universal. They are on it. So you get with it, please. Until the next time, we'll see you again on When the Lights Go Dim. That's a wrap. <laughs>